Welcome to Small Arm Solutions. Today is a really interesting video because I got an M14 that I like. Now, many of you who've watched my videos over the years uh, know that I am not a fan of the M14 platform. I decided to look at this quite differently. The video that says why I despise the M14 is about this rifle as a military rifle. Um, I will always stand by what I said that this rifle never should have been adopted unless it was for the end of, the, end of World War II or Korea. Once the AK-47 was fielded, this rifle was already outdated. This is not an assault rifle. This is a battle rifle. This is not an intermediate cartridge. Uh, 762 by 51 is not an intermediate cartridge. It is a full power battle cartridge. So instead of looking at this as a military rifle, which it never should have been, I'm looking at this as a piece of history. I'm looking at it as a rifle that I would take to the range that I would target shoot with. It's just a different way that I'm looking at it. So Looking at it from this perspective, I got a phone call from a good friend of mine, Mark Westrom. Uh, those of you who don't know who Mark Westrom is, uh, he is the former owner of Armalite. Uh, he's a US, he was a former Army Ordnance Officer, and he's probably one of the biggest collectors and aficionados of M1 Garands and M14s that I know. And Mark knows very well my feelings on the M14, because uh, he worked for Armalite. He had the AR-10T, which was a significantly better rifle, more accurate, uh, everything. Uh, and he called me and he said that I found an M14, I think it's the best one that's ever made. Now, for Mark to say that, that's like coming from God to Mark and he's telling me. So uh, I decided, you know what, I will take a look at this rifle. So, so he contacted Beulah and Beulah sent me this rifle out. And uh, my first impressions of it, looking at it from a manufacturing standpoint, it was absolutely gorgeous. Uh, I've seen a lot of GI M14s, I've seen Fulton Armory, I've seen Springfield Armory. And this thing really put it to shame uh, in the way that it's made. So uh, going through it, I was very, very impressed. I have to say, I like this rifle. Uh, I enjoy shooting it. Uh, I enjoy target shooting with it. Again, not a battle rifle, but uh, it's an incredible piece of history. And we're going to go over a little bit of that history right now. Once NATO was formed, one of the things they want to do is they want to have common ammunition and common weapons. Uh, and that's where you get NATO from. And in the 1950s, they were looking at a new cartridge that all NATO would have again. You had the England using the 303 British Enfield. You had the uh, United States using 30 out 6. You had you know other countries that were using 6.5 millimeter. You had an entire array of cartridges that were used by all the NATO countries, so they wanted to settle on one. And the first one was entered was one by England. Uh, and that was the 280 British. 280 British was actually an assault rifle cartridge using a 280 diameter projectile, but still was intermediate with a, with a shorter cartridge. It was not the same as the Soviet AK-47, but it was much it was much closer. The rifle that they put in was an EM-2, which was a bullpup design. But uh, we're talking specifically about the ammunition now. United States, on the other hand, we came from the 30 at 6 So what they introduced is referred to as a T-65 cartridge. Now, the T-65 cartridge was basically going from a 762 by 63 to a 762 by 51 so a reduction in cartridge case. Now, you also have to look at the evolution of modern propellants as well. When you look at these two cartridges, they are basically the same uh, with modern propellants. And the distances where you would see any benefit with a 30 out 6 are way out of the, 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 under the range of uh, somebody with, 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 uh, with eyes and not optics. Uh, so there was not really much of a difference at all. So it came down to these two. Well, as you know, the United States is very powerful in NATO, and they basically slammed the 7.62 NATO, or the 308 cartridge, or the T-65 in this case, down NATO's throat. So knowing that the Soviets already had an intermediate cartridge, again, we see here the 7.92 by 33 Kirsch Sturmgewehr, then we see the 7.62 by 39 of the Soviets, both intermediate cartridges. These would allow you to lay controlled, fully automatic fire in ranges up to 400 yards where battle engagements now are. You know, the World War I days of the 1,000-yard shots are done. Uh, now it's all mechanized warfare, and that's where the United States truly really screwed up for as far as uh, forcing the adoption of the 7.62 NATO. They forced a cartridge that was designed for long range, and that was the you know, it was U.S. ordinance. They wanted, you know, that uh, bringing back the half mile. Uh, they wanted, they wanted long-range shots, but that was not practical. So in essence, what they did was they put NATO behind uh, the Warsaw Pact. Their weapons were much more effective. And the United States wouldn't see that until they got their asses handed to them in Vietnam when the Vietnam, when the Vietnamese, North Vietnamese, and the Viet Cong had AK-47s. And in ambushes, they were able to out outperform uh, the United States with M-14s, which eventually led to the M-16. But the British were very defiant. They were saying, I don't care what the Yanks say, we're going to go forward and we're going to go with, with our 280 British and we're going to go with our EM-2 rifles. So they went to begin production. 
the United States made a big stink, and they went to uh, Winston Churchill. And Churchill himself was the one that said, you will stop production of the 280 British, you will stop production on the EM-2, and you're going to go to the 762 NATO with a fail rifle. Now, the rifles that were introduced by the United States uh, was the M14, or which we refer to as the T65 uh, back in those days. And the rifles that were being used by NATO primarily was the uh, FNFAL. And that was the rifle that the United States was supposed to go with. And they decided they were not going to. They were going to go with their own design. And the M1 Garand, which was declared the uh, finest battle implement ever devised uh, during World War II, they liked the design. Now, this rifle here was designed for long-range shooting, uh, the, the heavier 30 6 cartridge. So basically what they would do is they would take this exact same rifle and they would make some modifications to it. So we have our 30 out 6 magazine, 30 out 6 with our E-clip, which held eight rounds. And then we hit semi-matic only, of course. Hence the T-65. So basically what we have here is a modernized M1 Garand. Main changes. First, using the 7.62 NATO cartridge that was developed uh, for NATO by the U.S. Except for having eight runs, now we have a 20-round box magazine. The M14 originally was selective fire. That was one of the major changes. The next major change was the gas system. The gas system was moved much closer. When, uh, when, uh, when uh, Garand designed the M1, he felt that the longer the gas port was, the closer it was to the muzzle, the more accurate it would be because you know his, his original thought was the bolt was, would, would start opening before the rifle left the barrel. So that was the original thought behind the long gas system. Well, they found during testing that it just was not the fact. So they reduced the gas system to a much shorter gas system. They went with a fail type flash suppressor. And the bolt had some modification to it as well, which we'll see when we take it apart, was there was a roller that was put onto the bolt. And that was to increase reliability in cold environments. And of course, with the M14, they felt with it being fully automatic, uh, that, that would be an improvement as well for reliability, having the roller on the bolt. However, in fully automatic, this gun was not, uh, was not controllable. Now for the military, the rifle that was supposed to be the M14 was supposed to replace a whole family of weapons. It was supposed to have the light weight of the M1 carbine. It was supposed to have the magazine capacity of the of the M3 grease gun with the accuracy of the M1 Garand with the firepower of the BAR. It was supposed to replace all of those rifles in a one. Well, what they ended up with was this. And this didn't really replace anything. Uh, if anything, it was a replacement for the M1 Garand. The, the American soldier still was no better off other than having 20 rounds compared to what the Warsaw Pact had. So those were the main changes. Other than that, we basically have an M1 Garand. So taking a look at the features of the M14, we have a 20-round magazine. Your, your magazine release is behind. Your safety is in the trigger guard the same as the M1 Garand was. Now, one of the interesting things about the M1 Garand is it was to take five round stripper clips. So you'd be able to open up the bolt, lock the bolt to the rear, be able to stick a stripper clip in the guide and push those rounds into it to load it five rounds at a time. Why would you do that? Well, if you had, if you didn't have the opportunity to have preloaded magazines, uh, it would help. And of course, this is uh, you know, it's one way to do it. But pretty, pretty much you're gonna be loading your magazines prior to going into battle anyways. You're not, this is just the way the ammunition would be issued. So this is was one of the options. So safety, on the left hand side, you have a bolt release, so if we were to remove the magazine, pull the bolt back and release it, by pushing downward on the latch, it would enable you to lock the bolt open. You have the same type of rear slice that you have on the M1 Garand. Now the handguard was interesting. Now, as this rifle came from Beulah, it came with a wooden top handguard. Now the wooden top handguards was the way the original prototype M14s came. But they found that that would cook awfully quick when you got them on fully automatic. So they replaced it with a uh, fiberglass with a, with a type of a, a, of, a, of, a, of a paint in there that reflected the heat. So the first thing I did when I got this rifle was I got rid of the wood and I put this on. This was came from a friend of mine who had a brand new old stock of the fiberglass uh, handguards that were used uh, on, the, on the original M14s. So this is an original new old stock uh, handguard that was placed on here. Now talking with Beulah, they said that they are now changing this. They are going with uh, uh, one of these handguards on it because most people who buy these rifles, they want them for the Vietnam type retro rifles. The other thing I added to this was the sling. Now this also has a screw on here. This screw enables you to turn the gas on and off for firing grenades. And again, we have a, a, a foul style flash suppressor and we have a bayonet log on here. This is where your, your gas piston is. Um, you can unscrew this for maintenance. 
This rifle as it came, it was extremely tight. Everything, everything was very well made, uh, absolutely beautiful. So let's take it out, let's take it apart. We make sure this empty. Now we pull rear on the trigger and pull out. And that pulls out your entire trigger mechanism. Now we can remove the stock assembly. So what we're going to now is we're gonna pull the operating rod forward. There's a little lip on here. We open and now we can lift out the, the spring and the guide rod. Now we pull back on the bolt until it reaches its notch. Now on this one, we have to give it a little, little bit of persuasion. So we put it over to a notch and this one here, because it's, it's so tight, we have to give it a little bit of help. Now we rotate the operating rod and we can remove. And now the bolt, we just move forward and we can lift the bolt right out. This is all greased up, ready to go. And this is as far as you will take apart the M14. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna take apart the M1 and we're gonna do some comparisons. So now we're gonna disassemble the M1 Garand. Again, the same way, we're gonna pull back and lift out the trigger mechanism. Now we can remove the handguard stock assembly. Pull back on the, on the spring guide. Now we remove the recoil spring assembly. We're going to pull back on the bolt, same way. Forward on the operating rod. And we remove. Next thing we're gonna do, we're gonna remove the bolt. And there we have it. As we can see, M14 bolt here, M1 Garand to the left. Bolts are almost identical. This is the major difference is this roller. This roller was placed here uh, to work better in the cold environments, uh, so it wouldn't, wouldn't freeze up as much, and also for fully automatic. Now, the interesting aspect of this is, this was designed as a retrofit for the M1 Garand. Uh, all they had to do was change out the bolt and the operating rod, because the operating rod has a slot that would, that would work, so it would be a retrofit. However, when they decided they were gonna be going to a new weapons platform, the retrofit program was canceled, and they just added it to the M14. But as we see from the bolts, Everything is identical with the exception of that roller. Now we'll look at operating rods. Basically, as you can see, we have the exact same operating rod. One is just shorter for use with the shorter gas system. If we look at the recoil springs, you'll see that obviously one is shorter due to the fact that we have a, a shorter gas system. The trigger and the mechanisms are identical. The only difference being this one uses the eight round uh, E-block clip, and this one uses the magazine but the actual trigger mechanism is pretty much identical between the two. So what we're starting to see here is very little engineering was done. Now we start taking a look at the receivers. You can see basically we have the same thing. The main difference is it can be due to the use of the E-block here versus the magazine. Of course, we have the mechanism that works with the, with the, uh, e, with the e block. As we move further down, we can see that your gas block is all, all the way up here on the M1 Garand. Now it's back here on the M14. In fact, we can see the, the piston right here, which will move in and out here, and this is gonna be up, up in here. The M14 was adopted in 1958 by the US military to replace the M1 Garand. And however, that would have a very short-lived service life once the Vietnam War would start. This rifle was replaced very quickly once the US uh, troops encountered the North Vietnamese armed with AK-47s and the AR-15 was put into service. And that's a whole separate video that we have on the M16 in Vietnam. So now we want to talk about this company, Beulah Defense. Beulah Defense opened their doors in 1973, and in 2012 was when they started getting into the M14. What they started doing very differently than everybody else was, instead of using the cheaper cast parts, they were using actual forgings to manufacture their components. For example, receiver forgings. They would start from a forging. Also, the operating rod. As you would see, your operating rod would start as this, and it would come to this your bolt forging, and your finalized bolt. This makes for a much stronger bolt. And this would be your gas block that you would see right here. All forged parts as per US military technical data. 
Buell Defense has a relationship with uh, with John River Arms rifles. Uh, in the initial the initial periods uh, with John River John River Arms when they were manufacturing the M14 rifles, Buell would send them the the forged receivers, and then they would manufacture the rifles based off of uh, components that were parts kits from original GIM 14 rifles. However, once those parts kits started drying up, there was a need for M14 components. And again, the parts that Buell Defense makes are off of the technical drawings, all meet military standards. They are military grade, which is what really separates them from the competition. So as those parts became less and less available, the rifles became more and more Bueller rifles. Basically what you're finding out now with the John Rivers arms is you have a complete Bueller rifle, just with a different marking on it. So if you look at the overall market today of M14s, you look at who some of the major players are, Springfield Armory, Fulton Armory. Uh, you're looking at rifles that are manufactured with the cheaper uh, ca casting process versus the forging. Forging is more expensive, but it's much stronger. We're going to get into those details in a minute. But what really separates this rifle and one of the things that Mark Westerman told me, which got me interested in this rifle, was a TDP U.S. mil spec rifle. No shortcuts made properly the way that it was supposed to be. So let's talk about what is really important about cast cast versus actual forge. If you look at what, it, what cast process is, the cast process is, is you have a mold where you're pouring molten metal into it and it takes that form. And one of the issues with that is you have a more random grain structure, which uh, lacks a lot of the strength that you would have uh, with forging. It's, uh, it's, it's Of course, it's much cheaper. Uh, so that's why that it's done. If you look at the forging, forging is pressed hammered steel, which there is no change of formation. It's not mold. It's not uh, melted. It's not put into a mold. It's hammered into a particular shape. Um, it's much stronger. It's got, in fact, it's got about 26% higher tensile strength than cast, 37% higher fatigue strength, and 58% reduction in area where it pulled apart to failure. Much, much stronger. Cast has 66% of the yield strength of a forging. So why do I want forging? Well, I just gave you three very, very good reasons why you want a forging over, over a cast. So again, this is what truly separates the Beulah rifles. Of course, you have you know, incredibly quality barrels and so forth, but the use of the real forged receivers, real forged components, much stronger bolts, much stronger uh, operating rods, all these parts are significantly stronger than that made by anybody else. Now, Beulah Defense is also a DOD supplier. They manufacture parts such as uh, parts for 50 caliber machine guns, uh, parts for cannons, uh, 50 caliber BMGs, as well as the parts for the M14s that are coming out of Warstock. As some of you uh, may or may not know, uh, M14s have been brought out of Warstock because of the need in Afghanistan mostly, uh, but Afghanistan and Iraq because you have much longer ranges than you have had in the past. So you need the you need the longer range of the 7.62 rifle. Now the M14 was not pulled out because it's a wonderfully accurate rifle. In fact, there's issues to the contrary. But it was available. They could pull them from Warstock. They could put them right in. There wasn't enough M110s to go around. And there's a significant difference between the M110 and the and the M14. Now another pro product that uh, Beulah has come out with, which is very unique, is a left-handed version of the M14. The left-handed version of the M14 was done for a couple of reasons. Uh, first, uh, it was done prior to the 2018 SHOT Show. Uh, Buell wanted to exhibit their engineering capabilities, uh, what they're able to do in short periods of time. The whole project to switch the rifle from left-handed to right-handed, have a prototype, and a working prototype was less than six weeks for Buell to do that. Now, they wanted to do a few things by uh, by doing this. Aware of, the, you know, of course, you want to be aware of the left-handed shooters. Another really interesting aspect of this is that somebody who was a right-handed shooter who was left-eye dominant, uh, the left-handed rifle would work quite well for them. Now, you wonder how many left-handed shooters are there out there. Well, if you look at uh, what Vila's telling me, they're telling me that 10% of their business that they do in rifles is left-handed rifles. So that tells you not only are there are a lot of left-handed people out there, there's a lot of left-handed people out there who like M14s. So we'll talk about some of the testing that we did with this one. If you look at some of the specifications on this, we're looking as close to a GI M14. Probably the only difference you can really tell is the fact that it's not fully automatic. We're looking at the specifications, we're looking at forged receivers, mil-spec components, all U.S. military drawings all per U.S. military drawings. The stock you have here is American Walnut. It's a beautiful stock. And again, this came with the uh, wooden handguard that I changed. You have your standard, uh, uh, this is a standard grade barrel. They also do offer a, a match grade uh, M14. I wanted basically a rifle that would have seen basically in Vietnam, which is what this one came out to be. You have your flash suppressor, which is basically the, uh, the, the foul type, your, your front sight. And it, it comes with one 20 round magazine. Um, thanks to Beulah, I had like five or six magazines so I could actually get some testing done. Of course, 7.62 NATO. Of course, this would take 308 as well as 7.62 NATO. You do have the hole on the left hand side of the receiver so you can uh, mount your optic. 
Uh, 22 inch barrel, uh, four lanes of grooves, right hand twist, one inch, inch twist, overall length of 43 inches. You have nine pounds and a 13 and a half inch length of pull. Now you have a, you have a price of, of 2000, an MSRP price of $2,250. Well, that may sound like a lot of money, but you have to understand what you're getting. This is not your typical uh, M14. This is one, again, made with all these forged components, forged steel components that is much stronger than any of the other ones you're going to be purchasing uh, in the industry right now, unless you're getting on John River Arms, which is basically this exact rifle. Um, you know, not too long ago, I had access to a Springfield Armory rifle, and I tell you, when you compare these two, you look at the machining on them, first of all, they're night and day. Uh, you look how smooth the machining is on the Beulah. Uh, it's definitely different. The fit and finish uh, is different. Um, the quality is definitely a night and day between the two. I want to do a little bit of a comparison between the uh, M14 and the M1, just to see how similar that they really are. If you look at the uh, the weight, M1, 9.56 pounds. You look at the T44 or the M14, you're looking at 8.45. Looking about a pound difference between the two of them. Overall length, 43.06 inches on the M1 Garand with a 44.25 on the M14. So you have a longer rifle, about a pound lighter. And of course, we have the main changes as we discussed. 20 round magazine, 20 round, uh, 8 round magazine. We have a shorter gas system. We have an actual flash hider on here. And we have a roller on here. And again, that roller was designed for the M1 Garand, but it never it never got to it. So coming to see when you look, when you really look at the, the thought of it was supposed to replace all this family of weapons. If you look at just the main battle rifle, it's, it's bigger, just a little bit lighter. Let's talk about what kind of testing I did. I got 1,400 rounds through this um, because, again, not being an M14 fan, I decided to look at this from a different way. I wanted to see, just see, hey, how fun is this thing to shoot? Uh, is, a, is a target rifle or is a you know, personal defense rifle, which which it did. So we want to see how it would work with different kinds of ammunition. Again, there's only two things that I added to this rifle was the GI sling and the handguard. So testing, 1,400 rounds. 100 rounds of normal 150 grain full metal jacket, 500 rounds of Federal XM80 ball. Thank you, Mark Westrom, for providing me with that case of, uh, of uh, M80 ball uh, so I could get some reliability testing going. 300 rounds of Black Hills uh, ammunition 168 grain OTM, 200 rounds of Black Hills 175 grain OTM tipped. 100 rounds of PPU 147 grain full metal jacket, 20 rounds of SIG 168 grain OTM, 20 rounds of SIG 175 grain OTM. 100 rounds of SIG 150 grain full metal jacket, 20 rounds of Remington 168 grain OTM, 20 rounds of Federal 168 grain OTM, 20 rounds of Federal 175 grain OTM gold medal. So approximately 1,400 rounds went through this rifle. So what we're going to do now is we're going to take this to the range and we're going to see how it shoots.
And we had no malfunctions of any sort. This thing went through every type of animation, regardless of whether it was 7.62 Daniel specification or 308 Winchester. We also did something also rather interesting. Now, this wasn't specifically with this rifle. This was with a, a national match rifle that we had, had uh, we had tested. Basically, what we found was when this rifle heats up, your groups start shifting to the left. As you're going to see from the target we're showing you, what was done is we had an AR-10. Uh, typical AR-10 type rifle would be reminiscent of, say, the, of the M110 SAS that they're using right now. Then we had the M14. So we had one target, one side. Uh, they were scoped. Both rifles were scoped. And what was done was five shots were fired as a group. Then the other 15 were fired as fast as you could pull the trigger. Next group, five, first five shots. 15 as fast as you could pull the trigger. We repeated that five times, so we wanted the rifle to heat up to see what was going to happen. Now, as you look at the target, you're going to see how through each each session of uh, you know firing, firing 15 shots rapid, going to the first five of the next magazine, you're going to see how that group with the M14 shifted left. The AR-10 did not. And this is something that the M14 is very well known for. Uh, again, this is a battle rifle, or designed as a battle rifle. It's not it's precision, and that basically shows part of that precision. The AR-10 did not walk at all. No matter how hot that barrel got, your, your group never shifted. So that's an interesting phenomenon with the M14, uh, is that shift as the barrel got hot. You see most of the national matches, you don't see rapid fire like that. Uh, so if you keep the barrel cool, your, your groups are not going to shift. But if you start putting it really, uh, you know, you're running it hard, you're going to have an effect in your, in your groups. The best group came from Brandon from the gun room here in Shenandoah. He was able to get a 2.7 inch group iron sights with Black Hills 168 grain OTM. That is well within the U.S. military specifications for an M14 rifle. You know, uh, like Mark said, he said uh, this is the best M14 that's available in the market today. And you know what? I agree with him. Uh, the accuracy was good. The recoil was was good on semi. It was a reliable rifle, well made rifle, and is a target shooting rifle. I'm taking out to the range to have fun with. It's a lot of fun. Uh, you know, if you're going to go do your national matches, it's a lot of fun. Uh, if you just want something from the history of the U.S. government, I think it's a lot of fun. Uh, I will always stand by the fact that this should never have been in service. Uh, this rifle was obsolete from the day that it was adopted. Uh, the U.S. government knew uh, that the uh, warfare had changed with the modern maneuver warfare, which everything was brought up close with the Germans adopting weapons like the Sturmgewehr for, for close quarter fighting, uh, where you had suppressed fire. Uh, the Russians knew that immediately. Uh, the U.S. knew it and they ignored it. They went from you know, a 30 out 6 or 7.62 by 63 to a 7.62 by 51, which really is no change. As I said, with modern propellants, the differences are very negligible between the, you know, the 30 out 6 and the, and the, uh, the 308. So NATO was, NATO was put, to, put behind the eight ball. And of course, the U.S. would really get that slapped in the face during the Vietnam War when they saw that this was not the right rifle. Now, you talk to a lot of uh, you know, M14 aficionados. This rifle was built based off of the last war. Uh, World War II, you had the open areas in Europe. Um, you had long range shots. So the rifle they built was for that. Even though that your modern warfare was brought up close and personal, it was that you know, that old thinking or that old uh, time thinking uh, and ignoring the fact that warfare really has changed. And the U.S. didn't really get that until the Vietnam War when they saw, you know, the, the AK-47s. It just became obsolete. As a military rifle, it never should have been. But for a target shooting rifle, I've had a lot of fun with this rifle. And I definitely agree with Mark Westrom for as far as the way that it's built. Uh, the machining here is impeccable. If any of you guys are looking for a true rendition of the M14 uh, from the from the Vietnam era, Bula is definitely the way to go. You know, I, I spent a little bit of time with that Springfield. You know, the Springfield also didn't have the bayonet lug. You know, I, 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 would want, I wanted a rifle that was definitely going to be reminiscent of the actual service rifle. That's why I went with this instead of their national match. Uh, I ended up buying this rifle. Um, I never thought I would buy an M14. Uh, but after I got it, I really, I did like it. And this is going to enable me to do some more videos for you guys on Cold War era weapons. So you'll be seeing this in several videos coming up in the near future on Cold War era, you know, comparisons between this and a FAL, comparisons between this and a G3, and hopefully uh, this between an AR-10 as well. Uh, because you look at the Cold War rifles, was this a Cold War rifle? Well, only for the U.S. Uh, the true Cold War NATO rifle was the FN FAL. This rifle never found acceptance. Uh, there were some of them were made in Taiwan and China. Uh, we had a great war stock of these, but the rifle was so obsolete we couldn't even give them away. Uh, that was one of the 
issues with having such a large war stock. There's a very small percentage of these rifles that were left. Most of them were destroyed. We could not give these away to our allies, and there were still foreign military sales. So whatever we didn't want to put in war stock, we had to destroy. They've been brought back out for use uh, for uh, you know, for for a need where you have to have longer range, uh, there have been use for that. These will be replaced at some point. Uh, as you can see, the U.S. military is looking at a new weapon uh, in six six millimeter. Uh, it's supposed to bridge the gap between the five five six and the seven six two. We'll we'll see if that happens. Uh, the U.S. military is buying a lot of M one ten Cs right now, which will eventually start replacing all of these M uh, 14s that are in stock. But uh, for those who are looking to buy them. You know, this uh, the, the rifle this quality is immaculate. Spent a lot of time doing research, uh, you know, during this video to the history of the M4 and its production, uh, especially learning the differences between the, the cast versus forgings. And when you literally see the benefits of the forgings over the cast, I would never want this rifle with a cast receiver. I, I want to stay with uh, with the U.S. mill specs. Are I want a rifle that's made to the U.S. specifications, the U.S. prints, um, and that's what you got right here. Um, this rifle is full GI, uh, not, you know, Vietnam era. And talking to Beulah, they're looking at doing a, the rifle with the sling and with the proper handguard. So you'll be able to purchase that. You can still get them if you want with the uh, with the wood handguard. If you're a purist and you want a, a you know, copy of the first iteration of the M14, yep, you can get them with the wooden the wooden uh, handguard. Uh, those people like me, uh, I tend to prefer you know the real the real deal. Now, if you look at what uh, it's put out on Springfield. They have more of a brownish plastic uh, type of a handguard they put on theirs. This is the true Vietnam era handguard. It's a tr that true fiberglass they had, the true color. So it gives you that, that real look. Um, granted, the one that Springfield had is better than wood, better than nothing. But um, yeah, those of you who are real purists, you're going to go out and you're going to search for these handguards that are original. But uh, overall, my shooting impressions were excellent. Uh, there was no malfunctions of any sort. Uh, I was uh, very pleased with this performance. Well, I hope you all enjoyed this video. I'm sure you're surprised to see that I actually like an M14, but uh, as I said, we're looking at it from a different aspect. One thing that I can appreciate, regardless of what a weapon is, is I can appreciate workmanship and craftsmanship. Uh, I can appreciate something that no shortcuts are taken. I can you know, look at something that the machining is immaculate and the parts fit together beautifully. Uh, I can appreciate that whether I even like the system or I don't. Uh, but Looking at it from just a you know, sporting good way, I've had quite a bit of fun with it. Uh, reliability, everything was there. So uh, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you do, please click like, please subscribe, and even better, share. Thank you.